Star Ocean First Departure R. Is it good? Yes. Is it great? No. Do I like it? Yes. Do I love it? No. Let's discuss. Bloop, boop, boop. Bloop, doop, doop. Bloop, doop, 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 doop. Hey, I'm Michael. Thanks for checking out my review of Star Ocean First Departure R. This is a real-time action JRPG developed by Tri-Ace and originally published by Enix for the Super Famicom in 1996. I remember reading about it in Nintendo Power before it was released and being super excited about it, but then it wasn't released officially in the US until the PSP remake in 2007. Great, so now it's available where I live, but I don't have a PSP and I never did. The game was remade again as Star Ocean First Departure R for the Switch and PS4 in 2019. That's how I played the game. The base story of Star Ocean First Departure is actually pretty interesting. It does a great job of blending fantasy and sci-fi elements, and at times I forget that the game has both because I'm so enmeshed in one or the other. But at times I feel like I've lost connection to the inciting incident that started the adventure, like when I'm backtracking through the countryside trying to find four different kings to talk to them. We spent so much time doing this that I completely forgot why I was doing it. To that end, the pacing in this game is a little off. Some scenes that are just there for comedic effect go on for way too long, but then Transitions between scenes are often incredibly abrupt. We suddenly flash to a different location. How much time just passed? Minutes? Hours? A day? Sometimes it's hard to guess. I also don't love how the characters tend to just take what everyone says at face value, even the enemies. They're fighting against you, shouldn't you assume that maybe they're lying? At least consider that possibility. All that being said, when the game does deliver some good story beats, it can be pretty thrilling. A mysterious illness, intergalactic war, time travel, demons, genetic engineering. It sounds like a lot, and it is, but it's pretty fun. Even with my quibbles, I came away from the game feeling pretty good about it. The game starts with our three heroes, Ash, Misty, and Brock. Wait. I mean, Roddick, Millie, and Dorn. They're pretty typical young RPG protagonists, but they're likable. The game picks up when we meet the two characters from Earth, Ronix and Elia. They're such fun characters, and they feel like they have a lot of depth compared to the three younger characters. Any other characters you recruit throughout the game are up to you and the choices you make, though it can be pretty hard to guess what choices could potentially lock you out of recruiting a really good character. For instance, fairly early in the game, you get hired to pick up something from a shop in another city and bring it back to the person who hired you. You can completely ignore the delivery at the end, locking you out of recruiting one character. Normally, I play games to be as nice to everyone as I can, but I was following a guide, so I knew that I didn't want to recruit this character because recruiting this character would lock me out of recruiting other characters later. Also, the character Yoshua has a plot point of wanting to find his sister. It's generally advised that you do not find her, though, as this makes another party member one who is excellent in battle, leave your party for good. But if you don't find a sister, that locks you out of getting that good ending for Yoshua and her. It's confusing. But as a whole, those other characters you recruit have really compelling stories. I found myself feeling for them, and it was cool to see which of them had some connection to some of the other characters in the game, and which ones were just along for the ride. The villains, though, are not quite as strong. There are really only about four of them in the game that I could name, and one was barely there. They didn't really feel like much of a looming threat until toward the end of the game. We don't even see the big bad that we're trying to defeat for most of the game until partway through the dungeon in which we face him. There's a minor villain that several of the party characters have conflicted feelings about and mixed relationships with, but it feels like the payoff isn't really there when we finally face him. The NPCs are similarly barely there. 
I don't mind that so much in this game since the party themselves seem to have a pretty good grasp on what's going on and what to do about it without too many NPCs needing to tell them what to do. It would be nice though to have a few fleshed out characters who seem like they're living in this world even when the party is not interacting with them. But the main party that you control in this game is, I think, strong enough to make the category of characters still overall pretty good. I think the private actions command is especially nice. When you are about to enter a city, you have the option of making the party split up and do whatever they want in the city. Then you control Roddick and go, can go around talking to everyone, making decisions that can make these characters like Roddick or like each other more. The relationships between characters can lead to extra story moments at the end of the game, with, for example, two characters potentially falling in love. This is a fun addition to the game that really helps the main party feel more well-developed, but it does require lots of backtracking after every major event to see if your party has anything new to say. Add this to the backtracking quest that I mentioned earlier that are required as part of the story, and you have a recipe for some odd pacing. More on backtracking later. As is often the case with my reviews, I have the least to say about the graphics. I love the HD 2D graphics of the Switch and PS4 version of the game, and I think that sprites on pre-rendered backgrounds almost always look good. This game is no exception. We also have the added bonus of animated cutscenes, but those are really only at the beginning of the game and the very end of the game. There's a big chunk in the middle of the game without any animated cutscenes, and that feels like a missed opportunity. But the game does one thing that I really like. It uses the same sprites on the map that it does in the battles. This makes the game feel very cohesive, and it all honestly looks great. The biggest downside to the graphics is the animations for any of the magic in this game, which in this game is called symbology. Though sometimes it can be really overpowered, it takes forever, and the battle comes to a halt while we wait for the magic's animation to end. I went back and forth a lot with my thoughts on the design. I like the general visual aesthetic of the game, and it feels like the right balance between consistent and varied, or at least as consistent and varied as a game can be that involves swords and sorcery, spaceships, and time travel. But places and characters look distinct from each other, and it makes sense that the things look the way they do. What I'm a little less thrilled about is the character portraits. Some of them look fine, but some, especially the older versions of the portraits, look kind of unsettling. Now, you can switch between the older and newer versions of the portraits at any time. The newer portraits do look better, but they don't match the look of the animated cutscenes, which is too bad. But the character sprites all look pretty great. They match the look and feel of the portraits, so it's always easy to tell who's who. That's especially important when you're in battle and you're up to four characters and however many enemies are running around freely. Character shapes, colors, and designs are all easy to tell apart at a glance. The towns are remarkably distinct too. It's nice to see what's changed and what hasn't changed on both ends of the time skip, and I like how the towns fit the vibe for what they are. Quiet country town? Check. It looks different from the slightly larger town that's at the gateway to a mountain pass, which looks different from the bustling port town, which looks different from the more relaxed resort-like port town. The dungeons too are pretty good. It makes sense that some are in a more confusing layout. The pre-rendered backgrounds usually are stunning. About the only thing that doesn't always look great to my eyes is the textures used on parts of the world map, especially the autumn leaf covered mountains in the Van Kingdom. That texture looks really cheap. The monster designs are really interesting in this game too. Some are pretty basic, and a few sprites are reused and recolored at different points in the game, but I don't mind that. Similarly, I felt conflicted about the sound in this game. The sound effects are good, and I don't have much to discuss there, but there's plenty to discuss with the music and the voice acting. The music is by Motoi Sakuraba, who wrote the music for the Tales of series, the Star Ocean series, and the Dark Souls series, among other things. I know he's really well regarded for his work. This is the first game I've played with his music, 
and I feel pretty conflicted about it. Much of the game's score seems to me to be more about vibes and background music, and there's not a strong melodic drive in many of the songs. There are exceptions, of course, but the melodies tend to be incredibly simple, or on the other end of the spectrum, the melodies sound like jazz fusion-esque soloing on something wild like an oboe. Occasionally the Just Vibes approach to a track works really well, but there's very little music in this game that I find myself humming after I'm done playing. The crazy stuff is cool too, but again, like, I want something that I can latch onto and sing in my head forever. The orchestration of the game is really interesting. It does tend to feature a lot of oboe sounds, like I mentioned before, but it also has plenty of very synthy synths. I assume this was done on purpose to musically show the juxtaposition of swords and sorcery fantasy and planet hopping sci-fi. This aspect of the orchestration is really effective. What's not as effective though is when the grand fantasy aspect is pushed up toward epic proportions and we have synth string sections or brass sections. Those are usually not as great. The voice acting is overall actually really good, I think. I have a couple questions about it though. Like, what age are they trying to make Millie sound? Sometimes she sounds really young and sometimes she sounds like the appropriate, you know, 18 or year old or however old she's supposed to be. <laughs> How can something like this happen? But also, why does Millie's presumably 40-something father sound like he's about 75 years old? Stay away from me! No matter what you do, don't touch me! I am done for, Millie. The other gripe that I have with the voice acting is everything that happens in battles. At the start of the battle, a character is likely to have a comment on the nature of the enemy. These enemies look easy, or these enemies look difficult, something like that. But often, every character says something at the same time. Characters say the name of the attack they're using, and if everyone is spamming their special attacks, it's a nasty cacophony. The same thing happens at the end of the battle, when some, or all, of your characters talk over each other to give a comment on how the battle went. Basically, none of that voice acting was necessary. My biggest issues with the game are in its gameplay. It's not to the point that I think it's bad, but that's definitely where it could use the most improvement. For starters, map movement. It feels like the speed is just right when you're in a town or dungeon, but the world map walking speed feels a bit slow. This is an issue when the distance between towns is actually pretty big, and when you have to do as much backtracking in the game as you do. A fast travel option would have been really great in this game. I know an optional recruitable character comes with a faster travel option, but as far as I know that only happens toward the end of the game. The battles in this game were a bit confusing, at least at first. Normally I think JRPGs tend to over tutorialize, but Star Ocean is the rare game that I think doesn't have enough tutorials. The setup menu for your characters can be incredibly daunting to wade your way through. I eventually figured out most things I should do to set up for battles on my own through trial and error, but it definitely took me a while. Then we have the number of battles. This actually is just about right, especially since a couple hours into the game, you can actually use skills to make more battles happen if you're grinding for a bit, or make fewer battles happen if you're working your way through a dungeon and you want to conserve your resources. But the skills, like the one I just mentioned, are in an incredibly deep progression system. You can teach your characters skills so that they get more points in certain attributes, like speed, with each level up. Some skills allow special bonuses to happen within battles. Some skills let characters cook food that can be eaten to raise HP outside of battle, or appraise unknown items, or customize gear, or create useful items, or compose music that has benefits for your party while it plays. There's so much of it though that I ended up barely touching any of it. I had a plan for each character with the skills that I wanted them to prioritize, and I tracked my progress on the notes app on my phone while I was grinding. I know that I could have made extra powerful endgame equipment through the various skills, but I barely touched it. Even though with all the grinding I did, I ended up with each character nearly maxing out every skill, it was too dense of a mechanic for me to really have any desire to associate with that much in a game I was playing for fun after work. 
Speaking of grinding, there's kind of a lot of it in this game. Whenever you get to a new continent, there's a pretty big difficulty spike. You basically have to grind for a decent amount of time to be able to survive the monsters of that continent. Later in the game, you get a skill that helps you level up faster, so that's a perk. But as much as grinding can be annoying to some, I often feel like it's kind of meditative. I also really like getting so overpowered that you can completely demolish everything in your path, like I did with the final boss of the game, even without the best gear that I could have possibly crafted. What do critics have to say about this game? According to Metacritic, the game has a 73. According to my formula, my scores give this game an 80. I felt that this game deserved an 88. If you average those two scores together, this game gets an 84% or a B. Here's where that score fits into all of the scores of games we've reviewed so far. So, as usual, I have to point out that there are some scores up there that we should probably revisit at some point in the future. Also, another reminder, the actual numbers don't really matter. But I think that, for the most part, the order that the games appear in this section of the list is pretty close to right. But Ramin also scored some of these games, which skews the final scores ultimately. Now comes the point of the video where I tell you whether or not you should play this game. And my answer is... maybe? If you're new to JRPGs, I'd say definitely not. This one should not be your first. In fact, this might be one for only the diehard fans. I did have a really good time with it though, and I hope you do as well if you give this one a shot. So what do you think? Do you like this game? Let me know in the comments below. Please give this video a like if you liked it, or give it a pity like if you didn't like it. Two, this side is a video that YouTube thinks you might like. Check that out. Up there is the link to our channel. We put out videos reviewing, ranking, and rambling about various media, especially video games and music. I hope you subscribe if you're into that sort of thing. Thanks for watching. Maintain your groovy selves.